and it is a damn good day to have a damn good day. We're live. It's happening. Augusto Alverde, he's in the building. Global Child TV, traveling the world, and just made his way in his next destination to the Len Jones studio. Welcome to the show, man. I'm honored to finally be here. You know, uh, I've seen the growth of your show. It's incredible. I think that in the next two through three years, you're going to be the number one podcast uh, in the world. That you need, no pressure. You need people in your corner, <laughs> like a gusto, that believe in you, man. Like Let's you get go. people like that. That's how it is. And everyone that you surround yourself with says the same thing about you. No, and guess what? You. It's happened. It's happened. Yeah, You're no, doing it, man. Thank you so much. It's uh, it takes a village, right? It takes a village, but it takes the someone to believe that the village can even get started in the first place. And that's what you did, man. At an early age, your whole life, you've just been visualizing and executing. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, uh, to give context to the people, we began a travel show that currently is ranked as number one most distributed travel show in the world. And we began with a selfie stick and no resources about six years ago. And we've grown drastically thanks to, uh, you know, I'm a big believer, I'm a faith guy, but we also have to put it into action, right? So it's been a lot of tears, a lot of sweat, a lot of learning. And no matter what people are trying to accomplish, there's going to be bumps on the road. But uh, this very famous pastor said once, people underestimate, no, people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year and they underestimate what they can accomplish in 10. So most of us, you know, people will begin at something one, two, three years into it, they begin to lose strength. But if you stick with it like yourself, you can make it successful. And I got to say, even before we jump in your story and all the amazing stuff you're doing, out of everyone I met in Miami, you have been such an incredible person to me. I, I seriously mean that. Thank you so much for just all the great times we've had. We met through Peter Taunton. Uh, we're going back to Minnesota. I believe you're going, yes, we correct? Are. Yes, we are. Yes. We're going back to Minnesota <laughs> for the Twin City Music Festival. And I've just, I've just met the most fascinating, amazing people through you. You've gotten me to step outside my comfort zone in many ways, shape, or form. You've really not just been a friend, but been a, a mentor and someone I look up to. So, I mean, I appreciate you and it's, it's awesome. Thank you. The feeling is mutual. I think of uh, all of my friends, you are the most warm, open hearted. You just, you just listen, you don't judge. And you just have such a variety of friends, right? You're here to learn from the world. And I mean, I look up to you in that regard as well. Global student, Len Jones, coming in hot. <laughs> yes. But man, so it started with a dream. You wanted to travel and you are you created a company and a field that there's no roadmap to. And there's a lot of ways to do it wrong when it comes to budgeting, when it comes to filming, when it comes to getting a film crew out and building a whole you know, a travel documentary with all these different countries. You, you built the dream life and career that everyone said to themselves at one point listening to this, how cool would it be if I could start a travel show and just travel the world and doing cool stuff and eating exotic food? Very few people not only just give it a shot, but are successful with it. And you did it and you did it with a huck and a prayer and you've gotten really good at it. So <laughs> tell us where it began. I mean, obviously it's a very long story, but even before that, uh, this was never my dream which is really interesting. When this began to take shape, I was uh, one of the top club promoters in Miami, very cliche, very spoiled, kind of douchey. I, I was that guy, you know? And all I did was party, chase girls, and, and that was fun for a while. But as a lifestyle, it does get empty. And so I remember one day after another party for 500 people in my apartment, uh, I just felt empty and then I, I prayed. I've always believed in God. You know, my dad died when I was two. So when I wanted to speak to a father figure, I had no one around. So I would just pray. And conversation is that. It's just prayer with your higher power, right? In my case, God, Christian. But I, I you know, I only been to church a, a few times. Um, and I asked, I said, God, I don't know what I was born to do, but it has to be more than this. So please show me what you think I should do. They would offer me stuff in telenovelas all the time. I turned it down. Uh, they would uh, offer me opportunities to write. I'm a good communicator, but I really didn't know which way to go. And after that prayer, it was sincere. They approached me for a reality television program because I was one of the top club promoters in Miami. So it was based around being a club promoter. And once I was in front of the cameras, management came and they said, hey, listen, you were born for television. You're a natural. Let me represent you. I didn't think anything was going to come from it. And within a month, I had a national primetime television show. 
So I said, uh, okay. What was that like when you had your first show? It was really, it was kind of like this because you, you know, I had no experience, but I have three younger sisters. My mom, uh, we're Latin. So there's a lot of arguments going on and it's just, you know, Latin people, we tend to be loud and we speak a lot. And, uh, so when the show was all about debating, I could hold my own and they wanted a fresh face, somebody that, you know, didn't have experience. And so they chose me. So it was five chairs, kind of like the view live studio audience, like, dun, dun, dun. and then the cameras go li- would go live all over the, the U S and Latin America. And I mean, it was live TV. You just get thrown in, just the thrown sharks. into the sharks. It was, I, of course I got destroyed the first couple times. <laughs> These people are, are very loud and I'm more polite. And, but eventually it was funny because the producers used to tell me, in my ear, we have a little uh, earpiece, and you know they do it like in the movies, like "Good luck, everybody!" Five, four, three, two, bam, 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 and then the lights would go on, you know, and you're just on. But they would tell me, "Augusto, like more poison, more venom, attack," because I kept giving my perspective, which was like, "Hey, we're not in a position to judge. You don't know what you would do." I was trying to balance out like like the venom and the gossip with some common sense. They were not having that, and they fired me within two weeks. So I go to a church, and I'm like, okay, God, uh, I don't know what to do. And I felt this little voice that said to me, you're going to L.A. So I went to L.A., did the struggling actor thing. Um, they stole a bunch of money from my family. I had no, uh, no backup. And so suddenly I went from literally living in Bel Air in a mansion to a studio in West Hollywood that had no AC. Like my girlfriend left me. I had no money. I would eat just like, uh, like <laughs> eggs beans and corn and i was so happy when i had 70 bucks that was like my eating budget for the week and it was a paradigm shift right but uh sometimes when you want to build a life you have to start from the beginning so you went from this this when you moved to la you had this epic lifestyle you had some clearly some some stuff went down and you found yourself just in a sense going back to zero but not at zero because you had all this experience did you get depressed in that moment was that a sad moment or were you just like Woohoo! This is exciting. <laughs> What's going through your head? I think it's like um, it, it's the middle ground between both. Because uh, when you have no backup plan, I don't think you have time to get depressed. Because it's just survival. When it's truly survival, then you just you have to survive, right? So uh, I remember somebody invited me to a cool modern church. I went. I thought it was like a cult because there was DJs and pretty girls and music. I'm like, you know, it's very different from my Catholic upbringing. But I really enjoyed it. I got some added value from it. I'm like, hey, like, I dig this. I enjoyed it, right? And uh, I went again. I went again. And then during that process, uh, I really started reading the Bible because I'd read all these books, right? Deepak Chopra and The Power of Now and Eckhart Tolle and like all these different things. And and they all have some level of wisdom, of course. But the Bible really resonated very powerfully with me. And then so how old were you when you started diving uh, into that? Like 27. And then uh, as I was reading it one day, this little voice inside my head just said, if you died today, who did you help? I'm like, huh. And I think that's a question that I invite all the audience to ask themselves, right? Because we don't like to think this way, especially when we're young. But it's a valid question, right? We, we don't have tomorrow guaranteed, unfortunately, especially in the world we live in today. So the voice said, what, uh, you know, if you died today, who did you help? And I remember I said, well, I threw a bunch of parties because I was a club promoter and people were happy. I brought merriment to the people. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the little voice inside my conscious, whatever you want to call it, said, uh, that was all for you. I said, well, I went out with a bunch of girls and I was a gentleman. I treated them right. I was respectful. You know, it's like, that was all for you. I said, I was nice to my mom. And the voice said, that's your duty as a son. So I scanned my life. I said, okay, okay. I gave five bucks to a homeless guy one time. And the voice said, good, what else? And I had nothing else to show in my entire life. 28 years on this planet. And I had done nothing for anyone. And so I got on my knees in my little studio and I said, God, I'm really selfish, right? And I heard extremely. So I just said, I said, listen, I, I'll help people, but I don't know where to begin. This world doesn't make it easy for you, as you know. So I said, uh, do I move to Africa? Do I just go hug homeless people? Like, I, I, I really don't know. Which is a solid way to start. Right, just hugging random homeless people. Yeah. Mind you, this was pre-COVID. I'm not sure it would work now, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, I said, okay, God, please show me how to help. The next day, my crazy neighbor knocks on my door. I open the door and she says, listen, my boss was looking for a Christian actor. He's supposed to call you. Kind of give him your number. I'm like... Sure. Now, I thought that was my big movie break because everything that happened in my life was to make me famous. And so I pick up the phone and he says, listen, what I do is I'm a jail chaplain. We need people to come volunteer to speak to the inmates. And if you want to learn how to help, I'll show you how. So, of course, I did the sign. Of course, I I did the logical thing, which was I didn't call him back. 
<laughs> I'm like, I'm like, no way, man. I don't want to go to jail. They put me in twice. I have no record, you know, drunk driving stuff from the past. But I've been in there and it sucks, right? And so I said, I don't want to go to jail. Like, I'm doing yoga. I'm not eating red meat. I'm not cheating on my girlfriend anymore. No more watching porn. Like, I'm, I'm like a saint now, right? And so then every day I would wake up, go to the jail, go to the jail, go to the jail. I'm like, ah, after five days, I said, okay, fine, God, I will go to the jail. But if something happens to me, I'm holding you responsible. It's like, go. I'm like, okay. So I went to the jail to help people who couldn't pay me back. And on that same day, as I walked those rows and I spoke with those inmates on the outside, they booked me for a co-star role on NCIS Los Angeles. Chris O'Donnell and LL Cool J had to chase me in the episode. And it was like... So they saw you on the show? They, they booked me. Yeah, I was the main bad guy in an episode. So like, basically, I booked uh, a huge uh, acting role that I had never booked in three years in LA. Well, the one day I decided to go serve people. So I'm like, wait a minute, God, is this how it works? I do stuff for people. You do stuff for me. He's like, yes. I'm like, can I help more people? He's like, if you want, I'm like, you should have just told me, right? We just want our lives to work out. So I started being more intentional about giving back, about helping other people. And that really transformed me. And after a couple of years, I landed uh, a nationwide search for an NBC television host. And I just literally dedicated myself going every week to the jails. You know, one thing I, I always found fascinating about you is there's a lot of people in this world that use religion as almost like a crutch to make themselves look like they're so pure and perfect, but really they're using it almost as like a business opportunity and it's an ugly side of it, right? Yeah, yeah. You're so not that person. Like you so believe every, like everything you just said you're having these conversations with God and I've seen it over the, <laughs> which, over. which I just want to acknowledge that it can be very strange for the viewer, especially if they don't share my belief system. And I totally get it. I just feel like, um, I just want to say to everyone listening, we, we, like, we just have to share, like, this is the, literally who you are. Like, this is authentic. This is how I stuff. lived it. This is my life. Maybe, maybe I'm slightly schizophrenic or maybe God's real. I don't know. We will tell, but like, <laughs> that's just how I experienced it. I love that. I love just the, the, the nature of it. And you put these things out into the universe, you're asking these higher questions, and you're getting responses, and you're acting on these responses. But it sounded like you really hit this sort of rock bottom of you're looking into your own soul. Your soul was at rock bottom, but your life might have been great. I think um, the word is purpose. You know, uh, for those who have like this belief system that we believe in, in God and higher power and a creator of everything, you look around nature and every single thing you see in the universe has a design from the color of the dolphins to the hummingbirds to gravity to and it's all intertwined and they're separate systems. And yet they're all there in this perfect balance to create life. And so when you look at your genetic your genetics and, and your makeup, you're here on purpose for a specific reason. Now, we humans have free will, which is the complicated part, right? And you're never going to see a dolphin like, I want to fly and the eagle flopping in the water. But us humans, for a variety of reasons, we, we don't really always discover our purpose. And so the first one who wants to put you on your purpose is God. But we need to have the right intention and ask the questions. So I think my number one business advice to everybody who is hearing me right now is take a moment to A, figure out if God exists and to ask him or it or however you want to call it. Hey, what is my purpose in the world? Sometimes we try to choose our purpose and there is a part where we can decipher it together, but there is a pre-made purpose. And a lot of it is looking at your design, right? Like if you're great at bouncing a basketball and you're gigantic and you're like super athletic, like, Hey, explore basketball. Now, if I wanted to explore basketball, it's just not going to work out. <laughs> well, there are mascots. You know. There are mascots, exactly. You no, know, but all kidding aside, I think it's uh, very important. And so as I went through this journey of A, having the right purpose, uh, the purpose is not only finding our success, but your purpose is always going to have an element of making the world a better place. It's not just for the money. It's not just for your pleasure. It's not just for your success. It's for a thing called significance. But you almost had to go, you got really sad before you even started looking right you know it's 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 you had to almost hit a, a period an where empty, you were, it's an you emptiness. Were emptiness it's an emptiness and right? you searched you went searching and you found the answers because you know there's this like hole in our soul that we can put temporary band-aids on it right booze sex girls cars trips and all but at the core at the core 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 if you're not in your purpose if you don't have a true relationship then there is this like sense of I don't know what I'm here to do yeah. and it sucks 
or you know, I don't know what the purpose of this is. And then that's when people fall into depression. It's interesting though, when people who hit rock bottom, that's when you start making moves, man. It's once you, rock. when you hit rock bottom, <laughs> you know what it's like. That's when you sometimes have to kick yourself into gear. And it's fascinating how humans are like that. We need to lose it in order to appreciate it. You know, it's human nature. They say that, you know, people don't change when they see the light, they change when they feel the heat. And in my life, it was totally true. And so, you know, after volunteering in the prisons for a couple of years, I won this nationwide search. Then I was working for NBC. What was that like, by the way? Were the prisoners about you or were they like, who the is The prisoners are super cool. And I always love to tell them this joke. You know, I would walk in the little cart and I go see the guys that can't even get out of the cells, the ones that are in, in solitary confinement. So when they arrest you, if people probably don't know, they give you a designation on your level of crime and dangerousness, quote unquote. K1 is like, you know, whatever, you didn't pay your bill, whatever. K10 is like, Hardcore murder, like whatever, like this is just like the highest level. We go see the K-10s. So I would put a little uh, kind of like cart kind of like in the airplanes and I would have paper, pencils, Bibles, normal books and stuff. And then we go one by one by one by one. And it's just like in the movies, right? You have a solid wall on one side and then the cells on the other side. And the reason for that is you can face the cells and that way nobody can stab you from the back which is not a very comforting thought. And then, you know, I made all these jail friends and they would show you their little like weapons and they're like, look what I made. And they make these shanks with like soap to like fight each other. I'm like, bro, don't show me that. So is it, you just do a, you do some preaching and next thing you know, this guy's a friend and they're just showing you the, the I, gas. I, I, I go like, I go one by one by one. And then they, I, I would just spend literally sometimes minutes, sometimes hours. And uh, you know, my job is to speak to them about the love of God. Like, I'm not there to judge. I don't care what they did. We're all jacked up. Every human being makes mistakes. Um, so you would ask what they did? I wouldn't. No, I don't ask you them. You didn't. That was big. If they want to tell me, that's good. But that's not my job. My job is to listen to them, serve them, uh, encourage them, and kind of point them back towards the light. Was that exhilarating? It is satisfying. And uh, I do think that's definitely part of my purpose. And, you know, I used to love to tell them uh, this joke. I would tell them, you know, I, I like to come here because I have a captive audience, <laughs> which, which I did. Yeah. I couldn't go anywhere. And uh, they didn't know what to make of me because usually the chaplains, I'm a jail chaplain. This is my, my title. A chaplain is someone who performs a religious or spiritual duties in jail hospitals or, or you know or, or different places for the military or in sports too they have chaplains so i was a jail chaplain and usually they would you know be waiting for the priest or the rabbi or people that are more traditional right and i would go with my jeans with my little thing and they they, they didn't know what to make of me like you're not a cop uh you don't look like a priest like what are you i'm like hey i'm i'm a follower of jesus and i'm just here to tell you that he loves you and he's got a plan for you and i would tell them something that is very true i said you know god has given you courage you just used your courage in the wrong direction. It takes courage to rob a store. That same courage can be used to, to rescue somebody from sex trafficking. You flip the script. But it's true. And so we all have spiritual gifts, which is actually something interesting for the audience. There's a gift of entrepreneurship, for example, people that just make money easy. They're good at doing business. But the reason why God gave them that gift is to be generous to provide jobs, to fund uh, like you know charities and to pay for people's education and to do good. So what is the number one challenge for entrepreneurs with the gift of entrepreneurship? Greed. You see what I mean? Mm. Same gift, misapplication. I make money for myself and I don't help anyone, right? That's when you know you're out of whack. I have a thing called the gift of encouragement, which you have as well, which is we can speak life into people and our words can lift them up and we can encourage them but we can encourage them to like go back to the university or get naked and party with us, right? Yeah. So it's like the same gift. It's just how you want to use it. It's interesting when you see greatness in someone else, but they don't see it in themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think it also follows that trend of sometimes we don't speak to ourselves the way we speak to others, right? Like I, when I, if you were asking me, Ian, I, I'm having some issues, you know, the, the, I'm in this scenario, I've been really sad about, you know, this girl or for this problem, I would sit back and, and give you, really concrete, good friend advice that I would love that I would like to give to myself. But if I'm in that same situation, sometimes I find myself just beating myself up, talking negatively. And we were talking more just recently about just the idea of we need to speak to ourselves like we would speak to our friends. But it seems that your relationship with God is that friend for you. 
Yes, I think one of the biggest lessons that I learned is that human beings hear three voices. And this is a pretty cliche, but you have your own internal monologue. This is your soul. This is you. And this is your experiences, your hurts, your traumas, all these things. This is you. And then inspiration comes from God. It's soft. Hey, you know, call your grandma. Like, don't do that. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. This isn't good for you. It's, it's soft. It's a gentle reminder upwards. And then you have the voice called temptation. Ah, I want to do this. I want to do that. Rah, 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 rah. And most people don't really realize that not all thoughts originate with you. So when you don't know that, sometimes you're bombarded by these like toxic, like really messed up thoughts. And you're like, oh my God, if people knew. And it's, it's no, it's, it's not you. They're literally like, like the angel and the little demon. And they talk. They're external forces that are trying to influence you. Now you do have free will. You have power to choose. And the more you listen to one, the more likely that it is that you're going to continue to listen to one. But in any given moment, you know, like sometimes they trick you, sometimes they lie to you. But what you're saying is true. There are these subtle lies that we don't know that come from the bad guy. For other people, you can say the ego, darkness, from your pain, whatever you want to call it, we understand what we're saying. It's these thoughts that tell you you're less than or comparison or pride or, or selfishness. Uh, when you focus on love, hope, good that's the voice of god god never never points down at you and condemns you it says that you know god put skin on in the form of jesus and he said he came into the world not to condemn it but to save it and when you look at the st like the stories of the things that he did for people he always walked on everybody with open arms he didn't judge them the only people he spoke harshly to were the people who thought that they were really good and like self-righteous people so when we come to god we're like listen i'm human i make mistakes he's like i know I'm with you all the time. It's like, let's just do better. So for the audience, uh, after you've now learned who Augusto is, Augusto is actually the first person that convinced me to go back to church <laughs> after 12 years, you know, and, and I went to Vu, Vu Church. It's an absolutely incredible place because I, I grew up in Christianity where it was just forced upon me and it was... Yeah. Just not that it was. It was always just negative to me. It was just not a fun time. Going to church was was a was a miserable experience. Yep. But I I did I have and I'm gotta be honest. I, I don't go too often, but I I go every now and then. And it's just this incredible group of people that are young, fun, accepting, beautiful people. And it's such a crazy community that that's been built out there. So. I just think it's awesome that you got me to do that because you are sort of this purpose finder. You help people find their purpose because you feel so blessed and lucky mm -hmm. that you were able to find yours and you're, you've inspired a lot of people to do that. Well, thank you so much. You know, I always believe that you don't have to believe to belong. We have so much more in common as humans that what sets us apart. That's the whole point of Global Child. Our television program is called Global Child Travel with Purpose. You're a global child because no matter your race, your religion, your belief system, your culture, your background, we have so much more in common as humans than what sets us apart. We're all part of the family of humanity. So you are a global child, right? And so when people come to this faith-based community, it's amazing because it's not about how you dress. You know, uh, this pastor once said that it's true. It says... Um, Going to church does not make you a Christian any more that sitting in a car garage makes you a car. Like <laughs> so many people like call themselves something, but they're really not, right? And all that it is is God, when they ask Jesus, hey, listen, there's all these commands, like what is the most important thing? You know, how do we know like we're really walking with God? And Jesus said, look, I'll simplify it for you. There's two. Love God and love your neighbor. Treat others the way you want to be treated. This sums up the entire Bible. So if you ever see somebody that's angry, hateful, using it for like divisive politics, like oddly racist, like whatever the stuff is, you know, that's not God. That's just human beings like using religion to manipulate people. Yeah, it was interesting because we were at Peter's lake house last year. So about 11 months ago, we we're all sitting around the pool and you guys were going off about God and religion and church. And I was just quiet listening and being me, I had to step up and I was just like, well, what do you guys all mean? Why are you so into this? Like, in what changed it for me, or at least got me to start going to church, because I can't say I'm like real deep in that world right now, but at least got me going, is I just had so much respect for you, for Peter, for Kenny. And I thought to myself, these people are amazing. These are mentors in my life. They're friends. And I remember Peter mentioning that to him, it's like a relationship. Mm -hmm. You have your own relationship with God, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. 
and that that relationship is really what drives it. And I, I thought that was profound because I never really thought about it like that. Yeah, more than a religion, religion tends to be horizontal. Relationship is vertical. Now, when you have a real vertical relationship, it'll make your horizontal relationships better because you'll have more love. But I think part of that is you don't impose it on people. Love does not impose. Love leaves a space for people to find. And that's why we have to be respectful of people who are on their own journey, have different experiences. But we also have to have the courage to say, hey, listen, I was lost and I was found and this happened to me. I don't know about your world experience. I don't know about what happened, but I know that me, I look at who I used to be. For example, I was a college dropout. I uh, was a horrible student, not because I lacked the intelligence. I just didn't care. And after I started walking with God, I started, you know, reading the Bible. And then one day I was praying. I'm like, God, show me the next step in my life. And the whole dream that evening was about going back to the university. I'm like, oh, no, I haven't been in school for seven years. I always sucked at it. I didn't want to do it. But God knew that I had to do it. And so I went back and I studied theology and I graduated summa cum laude, straight A's my entire career. And when my mom saw that, she's like, there has to be a God because I know you. <laughs> like, like you never brought home anything more than a C. So, um, so God really does put you on the right direction. And I think it's just really nice because he just wants to do life with you. It's not a building. It's not an organization. The actual word church comes from ecclesia, which means gathering of people. It's a living body. It doesn't matter the buildings or the structures. It's just a group of, of people trying to do life together. Yeah. I love the tribe aspect of, mm -hmm. of truly. I think as people, we weren't supposed to just live alone, cook alone, do dishes alone, like raise a dog alone. We're supposed to be in a, a squad. You know, life's so much better when you have a role and you're contributing to society. Now, I'm interesting, uh, interested. So when you had that experience, you know, preaching in these jails, you get this big role. Mm -hmm. What happens next? So what happens there uh, at that point, then things started accelerating because, you know, in Hollywood, once you have a co-star role, like a major part in a, in a mainstream uh, opens channel, doors. it opens door. People want to listen to you. And so then I studied feature film writing at uh, UCLA in the evening. So I have a feature film writing degree as well. We started a nonprofit, which has all world religions working together to do good. And God showed me that what he wanted me to do is to build bridges between Muslims, Christians, and Hindus, and atheists, and just, just people to, again, bring them back together, right? And as that happened, then uh, I kept serving, you know, some national commercials, stuff like that, struggling. But uh, then eventually there was a nationwide search for a TV host for NBC. So I was in the jail, and I saw this, uh, it's kind of like applied to American Idol. So I'm like, no way, man. It's like a cattle call. There's like thousands of people. I didn't even apply. And three people called me the same day. You should send your video. Hey, send your video. Send your video. I sent my video, I went into the finals, and now there were like 10 people there at uh, NBC Universal, right? And so, you know, everybody's laughing, I look around me. So it's just you with 10 people grilling you, sort of? No, 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 but they're like the 10 finalists, let's say. So it's kind of like American Idol. At that level, everybody's talented, right? Better looking, younger, more talented, and whoever's in that room with the TV executives is just making everybody laugh. And you're out there, and you're like, man. And when you're a TV host, they want to ask you who you are. Because it's, it's spoken, it's your words, right? Like host. So they're going to ask me, Augusto, tell us who you are. And I cannot tell my story without including God. But I'm sitting there stressed out because I'm like, man, if I tell them this story I'm telling you, they're going to think I'm a Christian wacko and they're not going to hire me. And the little voice appears, which doesn't usually appear, by the way, just a full disclosure, just at very key moments. And the little soft voice in my uh, <laughs> inside just says, yeah, but who controls the outcome of everything? I'm like, well, you do. And he said, and who brought you this far? I'm like, you did? And he says, why don't you just tell them the truth? I'm like, okay, God. So I walk into that room, all the NBC executives, Augusto, tell us who you are. I'm like, all right, like, here's my story. And I told them literally everything we're talking about now. Uh, felt these cool little goosebumps. Sometimes people will recognize those little goosebumps. Uh, in Christianese, we call it the Holy Spirit. It's just basically the energy of God. It's cool. And uh, you could just feel it in the room. And I didn't know that the woman who was choosing uh, had a lot of faith. And because I had the courage to share my testimony or my experience as it was, it set me apart from everyone. And I got the contract with NBC to be a TV host. Which is great because I was broke and my family was like criticizing me. And this is very difficult. I'm talking about like three years of literally just all living less than paycheck to paycheck. It just it was really by faith. I remember this one time I went to church and uh, it was at this uh, ballroom for this hotel. And that was one of the low points. I did not have 10 bucks to get out of the parking lot. 
So imagine like it's like a, like a sad moment. Now it's shared because, you know, God has like blessed me so much. But I remember thinking, like, man, like I try to put my card. I didn't know like some like payment came in and I was in negatives and it was like late. It was like 1030 p.m. And I had no money, no cards, no credit cards, like no way to get out just to go back home. And I'm like, man, I'm like, God, please help me. What do I do? And then I just literally walked to the guy, to the attendant. I said, listen, sir, I'm so sorry. I came to church. There's no way I can pay you. I said, okay. And he just opened the little thing and then I went back home. And the, sometimes, you know, when, when you're a person of faith, because you have faith doesn't mean that things don't get difficult. Often they'll get more difficult, but he'll be with you through the difficulties and then he'll bring you up. And then you get that super level of energy that you work with every day. And it's interesting, like when you got that role as a TV host, what's it like when you have your first gig? Is it extra pressure or do you feel that you're just so comfortable in the scenario and you just start doing you? I think, you know, the one thing we don't account for sometimes are the reactions of other people. Because I was comfortable speaking. I'm, I'm good at it, like you. But the other TV host would get jealous. So they paired me with this girl that had had her own show for like eight years. And now they're like bringing me in to co-host with her. So she was very protective of that. And I tried to befriend her and be nice and everything. And she literally would not make eye contact with me. She wasn't sure of that. And she, was, and she was literally like tanking on purpose. And it was so difficult. And it was like, it was a very weird experience. Because I have like that level of like. Did the producers mention anything on it? I, yeah, of course. Yeah, I know. And we spoke with them. But it's just, you know, it's. It's weird, but I, I got a lot of experience and I was very excited at the beginning. Then after a couple of months, you settle in and you realize sometimes like what you really desire doesn't really satisfy you, right? Because now I have the contract for NBC, but I'm here and I'm interviewing NASCAR race drivers and uh, musicians at the Billboard Awards and I'm doing these things, but I, I don't feel fulfilled. It like, wasn't what you thought it would like, be. I don't, I don't care. You know, I don't care why did you hire so much. Like, I just, it, it, it just seems empty to me. It's just because of my, my design. And so then one day, you know, I kept doing things that are right. And I had this girlfriend at the time I thought I was going to marry. And you know what's funny? If you have faith, you know, God gets all up in your business. Like, <laughs> I think one of the reasons why people stay away from, from a relationship with God, because they know that he's going to have opinions about who you date, where you live, what you do. But what we forget sometimes is that God has seen the past, the present, and the future. So he really wants what's best for you, right? And so all this to say, I had a girlfriend and I was uh, driving uh, to church by myself. And I remember that I, I loved her, but I wasn't like in love. But I said, this is going to be a wise choice. In like love. she's going to be a good wife. For once, I'm going to choose wisely, like great mom to my children. Like it's cool. We didn't have the passion or the fireworks, but I'm like, this will be a good this, choice. This is an educated decision. Yes, educated. This is a good thing. So I'm driving to church and I'm like, I guess I'll buy a wedding ring. That was literally what I thought with that level of enthusiasm. And suddenly I felt like a hand like, no, she's not your wife. I'm like, oh my God. It's like, it's like but as if I was stealing candy from a kid or like doing something wrong. I'm like, God, like leave me alone. And then I like, the weather's nice and my peace would return. I'm like, what would she look like in a wedding dress? Like, I'm like, oh my God. And it was like this for six months. And then finally one Damn. day I said, you know what, God? I said, I get the memo. I know what you're trying to get me to do, but I'm just not going to do it. I ask that if you don't want us together, please have her break up with me because she's the best thing that's happened to me. She was with me for my transformation from like bad boy to good guy. I told her everything I did. She forgave me. So I had a sense of loyalty. I show up to her house the next day. It's a uh, Sunday. And she's pale as a ghost, hugs me and starts bawling. I said, honey, what's wrong? And she says, crying, she says, honey, God's been telling me to break up, break up with you for six months and I can't fight him anymore. The next day, I was like, wow. And she said, has, has he told you anything? I'm like, yeah, he's, he's told me the same thing. So it was the world's saddest and nicest breakup. Now she's married. She has kids. It all worked out. And the next day, I go to work. So I lost my best friend and my girlfriend. So that's always difficult. But I said to myself, at least I have my job at NBC. So I'm in the elevator and I'm going to meet, meet the, the big bosses. And I'm thinking, well, I might be getting promoted or whatever. A little voice shows up. <laughs> They're going to fire you today. I'm like, I reject that thought, right? I thought it was a little demon. I'm like, I'm getting promoted. Like, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, this is the Lord. I'm like, why? He said, I'm promoting you. I'm like, okay. So I walk into that room. Sure enough, I will. So you've done a great job. We were branding the network. We're letting you go, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, don't worry about it. It's all cool. And I walked out of that meeting all happy. And I lost my girlfriend and I lost my job on back-to-back -back days. And God, quote unquote, had said he was promoting me. Now, 
that did not feel like a promotion, right? So like a couple of days later, reality hits and I'm doing the full like forgetting Sarah Marshall. You know when he's like crying like in his pillow? I was crying so loud that I had a pillow on my head because I felt bad about my neighbors. They're like, <laughs> for Augusto, he's like crying himself to sleep. So polite. I was like so lonely. It was like really, really, really sad. So I would go eat my Vietnamese food and like the lady would bring me extra chocolates because I'd be all depressed. I'd go to the movies by myself. It was, it was a tough time, honestly. And so... Movies now, by yourself is a vibe, though. I'm just throwing it no, out. No, no, no. Now I grew, I grew to love it, yeah. So uh, with the frozen yogurt, it's great. <laughs> so I'm in Miami Christmas Day three months later. And, you know, you have your rich and powerful friends. And you have your poor, you know, uh, struggling friends or whatever. And uh, down here, there was a friend of mine that I thought could never do anything for me. And he was just always a nice guy. And Christmas Day, he calls me from Spain. And he says, listen, I have a Christmas present for you. I'm like, what is it? He said, I'm going to give you tickets to travel the whole world for free. I'm like, what? Like, why? He's like, I can do this because I work for the airline and so did my dad. So we have this like epic thing and I want to give it to you. I'm like, why? He's like, you know, I think you're going to enjoy it and you've always been kind to me. And so I remember thinking like, man, this is great. Like I get to travel the world. But then a part of me thought, man, but I need to be in LA to make it. But then at some point you're like, man, People try to make it to make money to travel. So if I can skip the getting money to travel, maybe I'm just going to go travel. And I've been trying to make it in LA for like six years now, and I'm not getting any younger. And you know what? I'm going to go. And then I said to myself, but I'm not going to do the backpacking thing. Like, I like style, <laughs> whatever, you know, I'll struggle, but I'm not going to do it. Funny, the everyone thing. thinks that. I'm going to need a backpack. Yeah, yeah no, send no, it. no way, man. And so, but then I said to myself, there's no way that. God is going to give me tickets to travel the world for free and not give me funding when it's needed. So I said, I thank you, God, that at the right time, it's going to come. Go back to L.A. three, four months so later. You have this idea at that point for a global child. You're thinking to yourself, mm -mm. no, nah. I'm thinking I'm going to travel. You just know you're going to travel with purpose. No, not even, not even just travel. You're like, I need to get out. I need to get out because I would see all these people do all these great vacations and go here. And I never. How did old that. are you then? 30, 30, 30. And so, uh. So I'm back in LA and I get an audition for a voiceover job. I also do, you know, VOs and stuff. And I hadn't booked a VO in, in two years. So I go to my audition on Friday, which I forgot to go, but whatever. My agent called me. He's like, you're so irresponsible. I'm sorry. So I show up at the audition. I read my lines for Verizon. It's a national commercial. And then on Monday, I'm at the gym giving thanks every morning. Gratitude is a key, no matter what you believe. So I'm just giving thanks, thanks, thanks. And my phone <laughs> rings and they're like, Augusto, congratulations. They want you for a callback right? For, for this gig. And I tell them, I told my, my agent, her, I said, I'm not going to go. She's like, what do you mean you're not going to go? I said, I'm tired of being the dancing monkey. Like, I'm not going to go. Like, why do I have to go for a callback for a voiceover? I'm not going to read the lines any differently. My voice is not going to change. And sometimes at some point, you know, when you believe in God and you've seen all these amazing miracles in your life you're like you know what i don't depend on any single human being you're like, like i already showed you like, my life's gonna up. like yeah my life's gonna work out like it doesn't depend on this casting director you stop having to you know kiss up to people just you know so she says okay i'll let them know you're unavailable so let me hang up i go back to giving thanks thank you for this thank you for that blah blah my phone rings five minutes later augusto you must be very blessed i'm like why they canceled the whole call back and they just booked you straight i'm like huh i'm like great thank you now, it wasn't a life changer at that moment. It was, you know, five to eight thousand dollars, which again it's nice, but you know, doesn't change your life. And Just to read some lines. Read some lines at the studio. So I'm like very grateful. I go, cool. I read my lines. And then at the studio, they're like, hey Augusto, we liked what you did. Can you come back in three days? We want to do another one. Sure. Another five, eight thousand dollars. Then I do that and they're like, hey, can you come next week? We want to do two more. I'm like, yes, I will. I became the spokesperson and the voice for Verizon radio, television, and internet in Spanish. And that gig gave me more than $100,000 a year. And guess what? I got tickets to travel the world and a job that I could do from anywhere in the world. And at the right time, God had provided the right job for me to go around the world. And right before would I left... Would you just send voice clips to them? No, they would tell me, like, what country are you in? You're in Sweden. Okay, go to this address, to this studio uh, at your 2 p.m. Globally, got it. Globally. You're in Australia. You're in Argentina. And so I would just go to these studios, read my lines, just get the checks in the mail, and my agent would deposit them for me in L.A. And I used that money to create the season, first season of Global Child. I started traveling. And two days before I left, my former boss at Mundos, you know, the Christian woman who hired me, she said, listen, if you are going to travel the world, why don't you film yourself 
as if you were a travel host. I'm like, huh, I guess that makes sense. You know, I have like red carpet stuff. I have studio stuff. I'll just do a couple of travel clips and I'll put it together in my, in my reel. So I bought a selfie stick, even though I thought it was the most narcissistic, stupid thing that I ever saw. I, I, it really bothered me, the people with the selfie sticks. And lo and behold, here I am, <laughs> thou shall not judge, because I am in the airport in Madrid with my stupid little selfie stick, talking to the camera and all these people judging me around me. But after I started speaking to the camera, I just felt like a friend. And then I created the first episode. We edited, edited it, and uh, I wanted to say something. Like I literally sat there and I said, listen, how can I bring added value to the people who, who are watching this? Like, what can I say to inspire or motivate? Just not waste their time. And so I put in, I wrote, I did the thing. I went to Israel and Petra. Petra is beautiful. I don't know if you've ever been. No. It's fantastic. One of the wonders of the world. And, um, and then I released it on YouTube. It was like a 10 minute clip and it had like 20,000 views in like a week. And people were like raving about it. On a fresh it. channel. Fresh channel, no followers. I'm like, huh. Then I went to Sweden, did the same thing, same reaction. And then people around me are like, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Yes, you like, this is the path. And, and you have to listen. Like people sometimes, even if they have faith, they're always like asking God, like, tell me what to do. But they expect some like magical voice from heaven when he usually likes to use people around us, even podcasts like this to speak to, 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 speak to us, right? I know you're in my life beyond just being homies. Like there's so many things that like I get so fired up when I hear this. I mean, even me and Sky talk about all the time, the idea of being able to travel the world and the how annoying it would be to have a selfie stick and how narcissistic <laughs> that is. But it also takes a lot of confidence and belief in yourself to say, F the noise, I'm going to do this because I want to do this. And the truth is people don't care about you. They care about themselves. And if you can truly find happiness in you and fulfilling your purpose, you're, you're rocking and rolling. And that's what your, your video. I mean, if you guys check out any of Gusto's clips, they're just it's you. You're passionate. You're fired up. You're excited. And you attract top talent to you because of that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, people can watch us. Uh, they can just go to the smart TV and put a global child. By the time you watch this, we're going to be launching on Peacock. You can see the first two seasons on uh, Prime Video, on iTunes, on Roku Channel, on Tubi, wow. on all Vizio televisions, on all Emirates flights, LATAM, Iberia flights, on 51 linear channels. If you're in Macau, you can watch us on TV and Botswana as well. Like, <laughs> just well, how, a, how many a lot views? Of I remember you, you gave me this crazy stat about like how many like views you're getting on these airlines. I mean, you know, airlines carry a bunch of, uh, of people. So these three airlines where we're currently airing carry more than 500 million passengers a year. So I think throughout the course of all the 28 episodes we've done, all the general distribution, we estimated something like 1 billion views. So it's been cool. Um, and yeah, like you say, you know, when I when I uh, started doing the first episodes of Global Child, I got super excited, right? And I had an agency called... Uh, uh, called Gersh and they're very you know one of the biggest ones and so they got excited too they believed in me and they presented it to the discovery channels and all these different things now to give people context the production value of the thing it was like me with a selfie stick right so let's say it was you know 20 30 40 maybe 50 thousand uh whereas tv shows like that usually have you know 150 200 thousand dollars and three camera guys and the sound guy and the editors and everything so as much as it had uh, it had character and it had all these cool things, the channels didn't think it was good enough to be on TV, so they all passed. So then my manager started getting frustrated, and then they basically said, listen, like this is not going to work. And something in me said, it is going to work. And sometimes you have to expect resistance against your dream. Uh, there are two forces in the universe. There's light and there's darkness. That's why Star Wars is so popular. <laughs> it's like a very basic thing. And so whenever it comes to into achieving your destiny, you have to expect resistance, criticism, right? But the good thing is, uh, you know, this one guy I really respect, uh, his name is Rick Warren. He has a great book called The Purpose Driven Life. It really set me on my own uh, path to purpose. He said, um, if you live for their applause, you're going to die because of their criticism. And so we have to turn off the noise both ways, right? And you have to listen to that voice and you have to do this for the audience of one. And so um, as I advanced, I said, this is gonna work. I kept filming around the world using all the resources that I had. I didn't have money, but I had friends, right? And so where there is a will, there really is a way. 
And so I started staying on people's couches. I started attending these uh, television, these travel trade shows, right? Where where all these countries and are this represented. this is the, the part people really need to listen to. Yeah, this, this, is, this, this is the part that now applies to your, to your business expertise. <laughs> so I didn't have the money. I didn't have the funding. I did have the idea. I had the belief. And so I said, all right, I made my trailers. I had my little iPad that I borrowed from my sister. And I was on in the gym working out, giving things. And then I saw LA travel show, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, LA travel show. I'm like, travel. I'm like, Maybe I can make some connections. So I asked for a media pass. They gave me one. I went in and I went booth by booth by booth. I must have had like 100 meetings, right? Where I was telling these people like, hey, take me to your country. Give me this amazing experience. I'll film it and people will watch it. At that point, I didn't have much distribution, but you know, whatever. I still had like my YouTube channel or whatever it was. And, uh, and out of the 100 meetings, I had two yeses. One of those yeses was a amazing a safari company called Zara Tours with a Z, Zara Tours. And they took me on a five day safari in my own car with my own like they driver. It they hooked it up. It was like a $10,000 experience. And they also took me to climb Kilimanjaro. Now, I had no idea that Kilimanjaro was tall. I just would go do the Stairmaster. Yeah, that's like legit. It's legit. And I didn't like train. I go to the gym every day, but I had no idea what I was going into. In my head, I was going to go up in a tank top and it was like, the, you know, like monkey. Yeah, you need to like pay someone to bring up a toilet if you want to use a toilet. And you need like like ski gear and like like people die doing it and helicopters can't come rescue you. You can see it on season one of Global Child. And so uh, it was it was great. And I leveraged that. And I remember the lady said to me, she said, where's your show going to be seen? I said, I don't know yet, but it's going to be big one day. She said, okay, I believe in you. I'm like, thank you. And so <laughs> it makes no business sense. But like, hey, listen, it's like, it says in the Bible that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so faith, if you didn't know the definition of it, is the certainty of the things that you do not see. The assurance that something's going to happen when you don't see how it's going to happen. So you have to walk. You have to take chances. Right. Like a lot of people don't go for the dreams because they, they think all the reasons they're going to fail. They look at all the things they lack, but they don't understand that there are serendipitous forces in this world that are aligning to make your purpose come true. They're just waiting for you to have the courage to step out. I mean, that's the truth because it's it, that's you can call it law of attraction. You could call it good energy. You could call it good voodoo. Mm -hmm. But if you really are focused on something and you just are relentless about it, the right people will come into your life. And you'll get surrounded by it. I even felt like that's happened with me in Miami and this group of amazing people and, and Michael and Peter and Kenny and just these great entrepreneurs that have almost taken me in like a little baby cub and, <laughs> you know, have been mentoring me and just spilling all these good vibes and energy on me. It, it, if you just put out that energy, but you also attach action to it. That's what most people screw up. Action. Always. They don't put action on it. Always. And, and you never, you know, it's better to make a mistake because you're trying to do too much than be afraid and do too little. For sure. You know, I have knocked on a hundred doors and maybe one of them kind of broke open. But hey, listen, during that time, you know, my fists were getting stronger. My arms were getting stronger. And sometimes <laughs> we're like, why do you make me have these meetings and these pitches and all these things? It's like, why aren't you helping me? It's like the wax on, wax off. Like yeah. he's building your strength. That's why I love the people that do door-to-door -door sales. <laughs> oh God, that's so hard. Because if you're down to do door-to-door -door sales oh, and just God. roll up on houses and just knock and just knock for dollars, essentially, you, it's basically this gauntlet and you have to just earn it. Because if you are relentless, you will win. You will make lots of money. But it will require a lot of patience, growth, and persistence. Now, I, again, I think the caveat and the important thing here is you have to discover your purpose. Because, for example, there was a time where my family wanted me to be in real estate. Uh, re real, like I am Latin. Sorry, sometimes my accent acts up. In real estate. And so they wanted me to sell apartments and do business stuff in Mexico. And I started going to those meetings I was so unhappy, so unhappy. Like, and I could see the money and the opportunity and the career and all these things, but like, it wasn't my design. It didn't fulfill me at all, right? And so when you find your purpose, how will you know? You will find joy. You will find peace. It might not look doable. It might be crazy. A, there has to be something in you that would make you think that you can be good at it, right? So I'm not saying I'm going to go try to be an opera singer when I have no voice, just because of an insecurity because like this person said you cannot sing i'm like i will show them wrong but i couldn't sing right that's like a a self-analysis but if you do have a specific passion and you have a dream it might be slightly different from what you think because you're going to grow and you're going to change along the journey 
but it's going to be in that, in that direction. In my case, you know, when I moved to LA, I wanted to be an actor. Now, the reason why I wanted to be an actor, we won 15 international film festivals as a lead actor. I did all this thing and, and I was a good actor. I can do it. But I wasn't as good an actor as I am a communicator or as a television host. Right. So once what I'm good at, the other one, it's like I was born to do it. With the television host stuff, you have to show up every day with energy and excitement. You're always on. Do you ever just have days you're sick and you're just fighting through it and you're just, you're almost putting a, f a smile on? I really can't say that to this point in my career, I I haven't had to do that. I think I'm so cognizant of um, the immense opportunity that I'm given every time I'm in front of a camera. So even the people that are watching now, I want to thank you for sticking with us this long. I hope yeah. that, that you're learning things, but I value your time and i'm speaking now to the listener i value your time and i value people's time so much when they watch me on television that i'm so grateful because i struggled for so many years you're talking about three four five years of not having anything you know you're going to burger king commercials and they ask you to read poetry and like eat the burger this way and then they like make you come again and then it's, it's just like there's a lot of humiliating kind of like um paying your dues in the entertainment you're world. You're putting your time you're in. You're putting man. your time that like suddenly when it's it's I think for me at least it was a humbling process. It was an overnight success that took 10 years. Yes. And also I think, you know, it says in the Bible that, you know, God exalts the humble, but he humbles the proud. And sometimes what happens is that people will achieve success, but their character cannot sustain it. And so for the people that their dream has taken longer than, than, than others, seemingly, or that are thinking about giving up the fight because they just don't see the results. I just want to encourage them that sometimes uh, it might be that God is simply working on your character so that your career doesn't implode. It's interesting. And I've always been curious because you're a producer, you're a production guy. You yeah. take a few people on the road. You're really, really, which I'm excited for you to meet Sky because Sky is also that. I feel like he's a little Padawan to what you're doing. <laughs> um, but you're able to take all this fancy gear, put it all together. You're Like my friend Sky Cowan, she does the same thing. She's amazing at it. But you're able to do it with enough resources to figure it all out. There's a lot of moving parts where quickly this can become way too expensive if you're mm -hmm. not good with your finances. What is the biggest challenge that gives you the most headaches as you're producing this entire show and essentially being the captain and the quarterback for so many moving parts? I think for a long time, um, and this is like a loose analogy, but uh, I, don't formula, I don't follow Formula One too much, but there's this driver named Alonso who's from Spain. And the guy used to be super talented. And so when he came on the scene, he would always drive cars that were is less than... Is he the than, Red Bull guy? He was Red Bull? I think so. I, but at some point, like, he became famous with, like, Ferrari. But before, he was with some other, uh, you know, like, lesser teams, right? So he would always come in eighth, fifth, third. He just didn't have the tools to compete with, like, the top ones. But he was really, really good. And he honed his skills. And one day, one of the Ferrari drivers had to leave. And they put him in a Ferrari car. What happened? Number one, number one, number one, number one world champion. And so I always like that analogy because it was so difficult to make the show without the resources, without the camera people, without the experience, but it kept growing and growing. And so throughout the process, I always knew where I wanted to go. For example, at some point, a couple of people said like, I like you backpacking and struggling, like keep it like that. I'm like, eh, that's not for me. <laughs> like, like I understand that like that's how you're seeing this, but that's not where we're going. So I knew where we were going. I wanted to create the number one travel show in the world. I would see Anthony Bourdain, um, who was a great guy, may he rest in peace. Uh, and I like big, beautiful, epic, wonderful things. Like this is what I want to do. I want to make what I want to do in the future is make big movies, right? Like Passion of the Christ meets uh, Gladiator. Like I like the big epic saga. So even when I was doing the the television programs, I said, man. I want to see 50 dolphins and I want Miss Universe swimming with like, you know, rainbows in the sky. And I just, I, I, I envision, I, I envision this thing. And so, uh, as the show grew, I knew that I needed to add the pieces that it could. So selfie stick became selfie stick and an Osmo Osmo and selfie stick became drone drone became like SLR camera. It became one camera guy. So every time you'd get one step closer, one you would step. just appreciate it so much. Yes, and, and I would be intentional. Like, how do I get for this next show? How can I improve? 
even if it was small increments, but it was always better than the last. And so eventually it came to the place where uh, a breakthrough moment uh, for us was actually the reason why we are here today, which was my friend Peter Taunton. He won Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year, and obviously he has a, a knack for business and obviously for talent. <laughs> no, but <laughs> but uh, we met and we share faith, we share, we share purpose, and he believed in me and what we were doing. And so he invested in the company. And for the first time, I was able to have the tools to compete with the rest of the people out there. And so the moment I had those tools, the shows that we began to make just started blowing you know, people's minds. And then the tourism boards started paying us. Then we had more revenue. Then we created travel packages. Now we have virtual reality. Then we started giving uh, so the, the more business, money away. The business model is that these uh, tourism boards actually pay you to come to their country and essentially showcase why it's so great. Yes, which is interesting because that's not what I thought. Most people, including myself, when I started off to do TV, I said, okay, I'm going to make a TV show for five bucks and I'm going to sell it for 10 Turns out that the channels don't really work that way. You know, there's been so much disruption that the channels say, no, 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 I'm going to do my TV show that I'm going to own and I'm going to spend uh, three bucks and I'm not going to give you anything. It doesn't matter what you, what you make because they want to keep the production in house, all these things. And so there's all these barriers to entry. But because I was able to grow it without having an attachment to a specific platform, I also have our independence, which was, has been massive. 99% of the TV shows that you see out there, there's a platform that owns it. That's why it's a Netflix original, a Prime original, like uh, HBO, blah, 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 because they are the only people usually that have either the resources, the capabilities, or the distribution to bring it into existence. To do it independently, it's a much longer road that I believe God had me walk because I, you know, you know, I try to make so many bad choices, so many bad deals along the way. And he was just like, you're cutting corners like veto. No, I was just like, like oh, like I'll give you 50 percent of the show if you put it on your platform. And God's like, no. And then these people are like, no, I was like, why? <laughs> and, and then like then we got Amazon Prime. So basically when, when that was a breakthrough getting Amazon Prime, basically what happened is like I made the series, my agency didn't want to do it. My manager stopped believing in it. Uh, they got me a deal that was horrible, like a horrible deal. They, it was this one channel called Ovation that no longer exists. And they wanted to pay me $30,000 for the whole season. Right. Which again, if you've never made a dollar with this, you're like, okay, this is something. But what bothered me was a small print. And it said, you are going to sell a season two for the same price. I'm like, what? And you can have no other TV hosting jobs. What? And we don't guarantee we're going to put you on the air. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm not going to sign so my set soul you up away. For, this is just failure. <laughs> failure. And inside something in me said like, no, like at some point you just have to get mad. You know, it's like the, the Tom Brady chip on your shoulder. Like I, I had this, I was like, no. And the manager and the agent said, you know what? If you don't sign this, we're going to drop you because like you don't listen to our advice. Nobody else will take your show. I said, you're wrong. Somebody will take my show drop me no manager no agent they go away the lady from uh nbc said to me listen if you want to sell your show the business of television is done at a trade show in Cannes called mipcom you have to go to mipcom to Cannes in france and sell it i'm like okay so i put it on the family credit card i took an airbnb i did my trailers and when you buy your ticket there they give you access to the database of all the people attending which means that i could email the CEO of CBS and the CEO of Discovery Channel and the accountant from Japan Television. <laughs> and I emailed everyone. I sent 3,000 emails. 3,000 emails. I, I don't care if you, you were the an janitor. Adderall and like, just like, ham. You got, yeah, you got the email. Out of those 3,000 emails, I got 30 meetings. Out of those 30 meetings, this one distribution company from Spain said, listen, um, we have good relationships with Iberia. Iberia is like the number one airline for Spain. And I used to travel on Iberia a lot. So I said to them, listen, I don't know how good my TV show is, but it's better than the stuff they have on there. Like some dude with like a, like a saxophone. It's like shot in the 80s. Like, doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm like, this is terrible. I, like, I, I don't know if my show is good, but it's better than that. And I said, and if you show them my show, they're going to take it. And if they take it, I'll give you your percentages. And they're like, okay, handshake. Three weeks later, they call me and they're like, Augusto, congratulations, Iberia wants it. So does Delta, so does British, so does Scandinavian, so does Royal Jordanian. And we became the first travel show to launch on 10 airlines that was, carry that more than like 600 million ago, passengers. Right? No, no, that was like uh, five years ago. Five years ago, okay. So it carries 600 million passengers. So now I'm on the screens 
for all these people that are flying and have purchasing power. It's the number one audience for everyone in the travel industry. Now, I didn't plan it. It just happened because I wanted to knock on a thousand doors and that's the one that opened up. You're pitching the idea. Like crazy. Finding someone who believed in it. And so then I have a wedding in Greece and I'm like, hey, I shouldn't pay for a hotel because I can't. So like maybe I can get stuff for free. So I wrote the number one hotels in Greece and they wrote me back within a day like, we'll give you the Sunset Cruise. We'll give you the, the, the suite, the presidential. The I'm like, oh my God, like, like I got power now. Like this, I can get stuff. So I realized that hotels and all these things, like if you're spending $2,000 a night in a room, you want extravagant experiences, right? Like, what are you going to do when, when you're there? You want to eat at the best places and go on the hot air balloon and like, you know, ride, For sure. whatever. And so each hotel has all these extravagant experiences. And then I just started filming it. So my production value went like boom, through the roof. And, um, and then a, a guy, a friend of mine uh, from Germany that I met at MIPCOM, he said, listen, I can get your show into Amazon Prime Video. Would you like that? I'm like, yes, I would. Would you like that? <laughs> yes, I would. I would like that, sir. I would like that, sir. Thank you very much. And so we launched on Amazon Prime Video. We're on the airlines and, you know, so on and so forth. And now we are currently on 15 major streaming platforms. Uh, Roku Channel, Tubi, All Vizio Televisions, uh, you know, Redbox, Zumo, Prime Video, uh, Apple Plus. Uh, now we launch on Peacock. And so... It's really cool and I'm really excited because uh, next month when we launch, we're working with a marketing team for Peacock. It's not just that we're on the platform. They're going to promote it for us. Let's go. Let's go. The boys. We so, out here. So no, so I'm, I'm just very grateful and it's been growing a lot. And uh, now we're creating our own streaming platform and we're going to launch another 10 television programs. So uh, I want to ask you about that, but I want to double click on the fact that you went to this convention and you got insight into these 3000 names. Anyone can go to these conventions and get these type of insights, but most people that go don't actually use the value there. The big lesson there, and everyone should listen to this, if you're looking for a job, if you're looking for a client, if you're looking for a partner, if yes. you're looking for a connection, if you put in the time to send out the hundreds and hundreds of emails, the personalized emails, yes. whatever you got to do, drink a bunch of coffee, you know, get in your zen and just bang out those emails, you will find an abundance of opportunities. But if you're not actively pitching and marketing yourself, you're never, it's, it's not Mr. Mrs. or Mr. Perfect ain't just going to knock on the door and say, let me in, right? You have to go out there and just send it out. That's how I got my job with Trueface. I became the first non-founder with the company. They didn't know they weren't hiring for a salesperson. I just said, listen, like I've done this. I'll do whatever it takes. You guys are clearly very, very intelligent and smart. And I want to learn from you. They said, uh, okay. I worked for free for a year, a year and a half. And then eventually made like $500 a month. Eventually made $1,500 a month, worked for just straight equity. And then it ended up getting acquired. And here we are. But it's like, you need to just send those Hail Marys. I call it Hail Marys. Yes, that's what they are. You know, you send Hail Marys. Oh, I know. So, it's so <laughs> trivial. You're, you're preaching to the choir, my friend. <laughs> it's called the Hail Speaking Mary. Speaking my language, yes. If you send out 100, 200 Hail Marys, one of those is going to get caught. Also, I think you have to prepare yourself. You know, a lot of people, they don't put in the preparation. I read hundreds of books, hundreds. And a big piece of advice that I tell people is, I usually go to the people I respect the most and I tell them, what is the most important book that you've ever read? You know, Bible side, let's say. And so they'll usually tell me like this book or that book. And you'll be surprised at your reading library that happens because you, you know, all kinds of genres, it just has different meanings for different people. And a lot of those books became very foundational for me, including one called how to win friends and influence people. So it's, it's a classic. Uh, it's in Harvard's like top 10 must read for all their students. And I think one of the most important things that I would say, and that you've discovered as well is bringing added value to everyone who surrounds you. If you're actively looking to bring value to everyone who surrounds you, the doors will be open. Because most people, they go out there and they think, I want to be successful. I want to make money. They think, me, 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 me. Mm -hmm. But if you bring added value to everyone around you, I always remember when I was a club promoter, there were two types of people, or maybe three. Uh, there was always the dudes that wanted to come to your table and drink your booze and hit on your girlfriends, right? Like on, on your, your, your female friends. Then there were the smart dudes that, that, that would say, hey, I have four pretty girls that are visiting from New York. Can we come sit at your table? Absolutely. You're more than welcome. You know what I mean? And so it's a, it's a dumb little metaphor, but I do think that wherever you're going, find ways to bring value to the people that you're interacting with. Max Anderson was just on the show and he 
brought up this concept of always following the third door. There's always like a lot of times it looks like there's only two paths, but there's always a third way. Find the third door. Find the way to provide value and to be able to make those people, you know, to be able to get them to like I was listening to this thing by Brad Lee once. He's uh, this awesome podcaster. He was on the show once and he was telling this story that his wife, they were at this dinner and his wife saw this celebrity that she was infatuated with. She was like, oh my <laughs> gosh, like I need to go say hi. Like, like, oh, like wh- how can we do this? And Brad's like, no, 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 take a step back. <laughs> this is what we'll do. He calls over the waiter and says, hey, what's your most expensive bottle of wine, right? And they say, hey, it's this one for a thousand bucks. Great, can you send it to that table and just say to the lady that we're huge fans and we appreciate her? And afterwards, that lady ended up coming over, wishing her and singing her her, her, her a wife happy birthday. And they had like a 15 minute conversation and she was so appreciative. There you go. There you go. It's, it's finding the ways to do things. Uh, I think also a, a very big part of uh, the success, you know, now we're talking about just kind of how we, we built Global Child. So at some point we are on the airlines, we are on Amazon Prime but I still haven't really made money. At this point, Peter hasn't really come in yet, so I have no investor yet. And, you know, it's been two or three years of just struggle and growth in distribution, but not the financial success. But it looked like you were having success because your Instagram's growing, you're doing all this travel, everyone who... Yes, and and, and success is interesting because success is not just gauged by uh, monetary remuneration. You, if you success look, is travel. So you getting out and moving. It's, it's what you're building. Yeah. Like, like again, if you're a company and you just keep keep building your valuation, 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 they might not know that your coffers might be empty, but your valuation skyrocketing. And guess what? One day that valuation translates to an acquisition, which then suddenly the paychecks come in, right? So you need to look at at the scope of what you're building rather than just your bank account. No, that's like also like having the long term vision. And so I remember that at some point, and this is like a, <laughs> I love to tell the story because again, I, I point towards God because it's not, it's not me. I'm just going to give you an example. So um, made a bunch of episodes, season one, part of season two. And then these friends of mine that uh, they're very well connected in the Middle East, they meet me for a coffee here and, and they say, listen, we want you to film in Qatar. You know, uh, I'm like, Qatar, like, sure. Uh, he's like, give us a proposal. And I remember I was using a thing that we call uh, lack mentality. I had been with lack for so long, I started thinking little. And so I went and I asked them, I said, uh, okay, you know, two business class tickets, uh, everything paid for, $5,000. When you're super broke and you're just going like from like uh, <laughs> like eggs and corn to eggs and corn, uh, you think like, oh, well, no, five grand, like, but it's not bad for a week, right? Yeah. And so that's what I asked for. Well, they basically never responded to me, right? And then at that point, Qatar started almost, uh, uh, there was almost a war in the Middle East. So a few months go by, I keep filming. And then I have a conversation with a friend of mine who actually sat here on your couch, Freddie Seedy. So Freddie studied at Harvard and he gives great business advice. And so he said to me, listen, if you're dealing with countries in the Middle East, the minimum you have to ask for is 100000 to $500,000. Otherwise, they won't even consider you. And I say to him, well, funny you say that because that's what making a TV show would usually cost. And so he says, that's what you should ask for. I'm like, you're right. But I mean, (laughs) it's like the opportunity is no longer there. Lo and behold, the same friends invite me for a coffee in the same place where we went. And they sit with me and they say, hey, give us a proposal. It's like. I believe God he just like wiped their so mind. So they basically said, oh, let's just give you another shot at we'll this. give me another shot. Let, let's uh, re- like repeat. And so I'm sitting there and now my answer is different. I say, listen, uh, television can be as cheap or as expensive as you want. It just depends on the bells and whistles. And they said, we want the best. I said, the best is expensive. They're like, how much? I'm like, 100,000 euros. They're like, let's do it. Two weeks later, I had $60,000 in my bank account. We were on our way to Qatar. Like for the first time I made money and I broke the $100,000 mark just simply by asking where I had asked, I had had asked for five, right? So just, just so So that lesson there is you have to ask if, or it's never going to happen and know your value. And now I'm speaking to the artists out there. Art is so subjective, whether you're making television or you're a musician or, or you are making podcasts or what there's. It's if you don't value yourself, third parties are not going to value yourself. And there's a fine balance between doing the sweat equity and knowing your worth. And sometimes when you've been struggling for a while, we really do need a a timeout because sometimes people will respect you when you're like, no, this is my price. I'm worth it. 
and you know like in, in sales sometimes like it works so for me it was just like a like a huge breakthrough moment it was the first time we actually made money and again i give the glory to god because look what augusto did <laughs> augusto was the first answer and then again he spoke through my friend freddie i listened i changed my approach and i had another opportunity at it freddie's such a good guy he was telling the story about building chargello and how this this one uh restaurant was wasn't giving him the time of day and he was sitting there in the lobby after the guy blew him off like three or four times. I don't know if he told you the story, mm -mm. but basically some person came in and was just asking him a bunch of questions and asked if he had a charger and he happened to have a charger. And lo and behold, she charges her phone. They have a great conversation. The owner finally comes out to greet that person and it was someone from TripAdvisor, right? And the girl said, oh my God, I love your place so much. You have the best chargers. This is incredible. So as he's leaving, the owner comes running after him like, Freddie, Freddie, we need to get your chargers in here after he just <laughs> yeah. denied him and denied him, denied him, denied him. That's the example of going in there, finding someone that sees value in you and consistently pushing yourself outside your comfort zone, which is what you've done, man. Your entire life is this just driving force. And for you, it's God and this this higher creation, which you've clearly expressed pretty he like <laughs> aggressively on the podcast because that's yeah. who you are yeah. but you've used it as fuel consistently every time you get denied you're like oh this is part of the plan god is speaking to me i must continue i must move on and you just keep doing that and you keep leveling up and you keep going and if you get shot down tomorrow you're gonna say oh it's all part of the plan what is my purpose and you'll reinvent yourself it's an amazing mentality. If people had that mentality, they wouldn't need to go to Harvard. They wouldn't need to go to these prestigious stuff. They would just grassroot entrepreneur the F out of their life. They would get anything they want. So how do you think that people can get on your level when it comes to that relentless drive to just continuously seek answers? First of all, thank you for those incredible words. Uh, again, I, I really value them and I receive them. It's one of my love languages, words of affirmation. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I mean, it's more than drive. There's a lot of people who are very, very driven. You know, I think of the, again, so many people that just do all kinds of jobs that are uh, require such grit, right? Construction workers, you know, single moms. I've seen it with my mom. It's, it's like, there's, there's all kinds of people and I don't think drive alone does it. I think it's drive plus purpose. Drive plus purpose. Because you can have the drive, but if you're driving in the wrong direction, you're not going to get to the right destination. And that's a fact. And it doesn't matter how much you desire it, how much you put the pedal to the metal. If you run out of gas, if you find more gas, if you're going on the right direction, you're going to arrive to the wrong destination, right? So how do you find the right destination? Again, I believe in this system, <laughs> just asking right? Listening and having the humility to understand like, Hey, listen, maybe this is not the path. And it, it, it takes, it, it takes a humility to understand that, uh, at some point in between when I started with a TV show and when I was the, the club promoting douchebag, I tried to open up my own <laughs> nightclub. Okay. I lost $300,000 and I ended up in a wheelchair because of stress. My lower back popped out. So I'm sitting in my little mansion at 25. I can't walk. Like I'm, I'm just like so stressed out and I wanted to make the nightclub work. And no matter how much I tried, I had the same drive that I did for Global Child, but I wanted to drive in the wrong direction. Why? Because it would have led to my destruction. And so no matter what I did, three times I found investors, three times that said yes. And three times at the time at signing some like act of God, quote unquote, literally like, like uh, a bubble burst in real estate around the world. So one guy fell off, another guy had a medical emergency, another, like just stuff would happen that it never came to fruition. And the place I rented where I was paying like $19,000 of rent every month and I had to give that check, it was horrible. 19 k a month, okay, in a month Miami. for an empty space in Miami and I would walk past it. You know what it became? It became a 7-Eleven. And these people left the posters of my place called, it was called Gallery on the top. And when they ripped it off, they're so sloppy that to this day, okay, eight years later, you still see Gallery. I'll walk with you in Brickle and I'll show it to you. And it still, it still says Gallery. And I believe that's a reminder of, from, from, from God, the universe, whatever, to me, hey, stay humble, stay on the right path, right? So I guess my advice to people would be A, believe, right? Two, why are you doing this? 
So big part of the motivation is because remember that conversation about who did you help? Everything I do, and it's not my default, but I think like, how can I help people with this? How can I bring value? How can I teach? How can I encourage? How can I give? How can I create? Even if it's just creating beautiful things. Like if a chef sits there and he creates the most incredible food and it becomes a memory for this group of people, he made their life better, right? So it's not always the charitable act itself. Now, charity, of course, inspiration. It's just always being mindful when I sit there and I write the voiceovers for the shows. I pray and I'm like, God, give me the words to make this meaningful. I could just give a throwaway line, right? Like the palm trees were so pretty. Or I could say, listen, you know, palm trees are the only tree that actually have the ability to bend. And it's when they face storms that they bend that it makes the roots grow deeper and it makes them stronger. Love that. Same thing, right? So in our life, where are we using our platform, even as parents, as entrepreneurs, as job owners, as influencers, to bring value and make people's lives better? That's it. That's what it comes down to. And when I look at you and I think about how far you've come, I'm curious uh, if you were to be able to go back in time, go back in history and speak to a younger version of yourself, maybe you at 16 yeah, and who you are now could talk to that person at 16 and you could have said something that could have just saved you a ton of time, money, heartache, headache, sadness, uh, pimples, anxiety, and you know, obviously, a great answer is I wouldn't have said anything because it made me who I am today, and all of the course, trials and tribulations. But <laughs> the, for the, the sake of out. the question, let's yes. not do that. Yes, of course. What are some of those things that the older you would have tried to try to say to that younger you? I would talk to him about purpose. I would talk to him. Uh, I rec- recently read a wonderful book that I recommend to everyone. It's called uh, "Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets" by an author called Andy Stanley, and. In this book, it talks about like taking every choice you make through five uh, basic questions. And the number one says, you usually know what a good decision is. You don't have to sell yourself. The moment you're selling yourself on something, stop, right? Another huge, huge part of that is says... I love that. That resonates <laughs> it's like, so much. It's like, stop. That, we He's, were just talking about that the other day. He, he always, you have to convince yourself it's not the right decision. Yes, and he says, listen to the tension. Like if there's any kind of tension, listen to it. Number two, he says... Every decision you make is a page you're writing, you're writing in the book of your life and you won't be able to take it back. Now, can it be redeemed? Can it be part of a larger story? Sure, but it will be part of your story. And I think so many of the choices I personally made, uh, I was not thinking that I was writing a book. I was not listening to the tension. I was just living in the moment and I was oblivious to the possible consequences, to who I was becoming, to the kind of person that I was going to to be. Now, because of uh, the way my life worked out, I guess it helps to create a, a larger contrast of who I was before my faith and after my faith. So, you know, God used it for good. So we can say like, I know Augusto <laughs> and like he has changed, right? Um, but yeah, I would have told myself to uh, just to think at the larger picture and be less selfish. Man, I know that there's, uh, when you get behind a mic, you just, you, you, you just blow up your, your personality comes out, your purpose comes out, everything that you've just talked about comes out. I get fired up. Like I'm on a talk show host because this is the energy you bring to a talk show. This is the energy that got you everywhere. (laughs) And, And it inspires myself and all the listeners to know that if you can elevate that energy, if you can follow the path, you can follow your purpose, you can listen to the voice in your head, listen to that internal compass and constantly just stop giving up, believe in yourself, talk good things in yourself, you can eventually achieve these fruits. You can make it. But I think the thing that sticks with me is that you just, every day you just did something better. Yes. Every day with every one of these videos, you got a better camera or you did a better show or you did a better shot. You got the drone. And then eventually you had enough stature for someone like a Peter to come in and believe in you because he's no dummy. You know, he surrounds himself with great people. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm still, that's why I'm like, every time I'm around him, I'm like, this is a testament to myself. You know, this is great. (laughs) You know, it's just, it's interesting because your relentlessness has got you this far. And I just think that everyone needs to understand that it's duplicatable. It's possible. 
And I'm just, I'm just grateful that you share with people. I mean, your purpose has just influenced my life. It's going to influence a lot more viewers and you're just getting started. You're so young, man. Like I'm excited for all the future projects because global child is going to be, it's already everywhere, but it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But then when your platform comes out and I'm subscribing my $9 to, <laughs> to Gusto's travel platform, I'm pretty stoked. Which 50% of that platform is going to go help nonprofits around the world. So again, and you're serious about that. You're actually going to take 50% because a lot of people yeah. say that and no, they no, just no. never do it's, it. It's the platform's built and we already signed up St. Jude's Children's Hospital, the Red Cross, Habitat for Humanity. And I literally sat there. Again, I use the same logic, right? I said, somebody approached me, you know, antennas up and he says, hey, you have enough content. I want to make a streaming platform for yourself. And I took that idea and I said, how can I do the most good? And I said, listen, this needs to be greater than Global Child. It needs to be greater than a show. Uh, we Let's make more shows and how can we do the most possible good? And I was thinking, well, imagine if Netflix grabbed half of its money and gave it to nonprofits. I'm like, wow, like they would change the world. And what if they used the other half and made content that made the world a better place? Wow, it would make the, the world a better place. And then uh, night after night, I would pray about it. I'm like, how do I do it? How do I do it? I'm like, but we're never going to make money. It's not going to work. And then one day I had a dream and it's like travel packages. Like you will sell travel packages. All these TV shows, they're going to have travel packages that people can book. And they're going to include a give back component. They're your travel with purpose trip. So you will go to Antigua, but you'll clean a beach and you'll go to India and you'll visit the leper colony. And of course it's customizable. If you don't want to do it, you don't do it. But we make it easy for the people to go and do good, right? So where are you going to book your travel package? Are you going to go to Expedia, Kayak, or your travel with purpose trip? Travel with purpose. Let's go. And so that's kind of where we're going. Um, thank you so much for your words. I think uh, another big piece of advice that I would tell people is dream big. You know, as, as we began to grow, I'll give you an example. <laughs> so I didn't have uh, a team around me, again, because I didn't have funding. And this friend of mine, uh, JP, JP Kawari, who I love very much, uh, great business guy, super successful. He had bought this platform called Ninja Outreach, which he now sold. But basically, this thing allowed you to, uh, let's say, find the emails of all these companies and then send them personalized emails like through a robot, right? So I would put like luxury hotels, uh, Greece, and get me like all their emails. And then I'd write an email and they would put the name like, like, thank you, Astra Suites. Like, thank you, blah, blah, blah. Nice to meet you. And then I would write, this bot would write like hundreds of emails to all these companies. And right. so suddenly I'm, I would just, because I had to find ways to, to do all these Outsource, outreach. Yeah, yeah. And through that, I ended up contacting this uh, talent manager. And one day they're like, hey, you know, uh, I represent like Miss Universe. Like maybe she wants to film with you. I'm like, Miss Universe. I'm like, yes, she has 28 million followers. 13 million on Instagram. Her name is Katrona Gray and 9 million on other platforms. And so I knew that I was going to work with her one day, but I wasn't ready. So it's also knowing when, like the timing of it. And so we kept growing, we kept evolving. And then one day through a friend of mine, again, uh, they offered us to film in Mauritius at the Four Seasons. I said, hey, Mauritius, Four Seasons. Now, if I was Miss Universe, that's a cool place. I'd want to go <laughs> to Mauritius. So we spoke and she was very gracious. She came with Samuel Milby, who's the biggest actor in the Philippines, her boyfriend. We had such a beautiful shoot. And that's the number one episode that we're going to launch with on Peacock that has a Miss Universe. And so again... Everything you do in your industry, whether it's uh, you're cleaning cars or you're selling cigars, how do you make your product better? But have the, the, the gumption, let's just call it, to go bigger, like try, right? Like what's the worst that can happen? In Mexico, they always say the saying, you know, like they're like, you already have the no. Like if you don't try, it doesn't change. Right. You, you, you just have the no already. Then a friend of mine also, again, antennas up. Somebody brought the platform and then a few months ago, somebody says, hey, listen, I have this guy from Costa Rica. He makes virtual reality. It'd be great for you. Let me show you. I listened and he showed me this virtual reality technology. And I'm like, oh my God. I said, listen, I'm working with all these tourism boards. You know how to make VR. Let's team up. Let's make VR for the tourism boards. Lo and behold, we did it. So now we have a virtual, virtual reality division, right? And so again, it's having the ability. Um, I see in the show, a competitor is just someone I haven't learned to collaborate with yet. That's where the power is. Take care of your relationships. There's been so many people around my journey, you know, years ago where they couldn't do anything for me, quote unquote, or I didn't ask for anything from them, quote unquote, but they're people and they're wise and they're beautiful and they have knowledge and they're friendly. And so, hey, just check in with the people. Like, 
You know what I mean? Like, just I, I kept and in touch. You're an all star at that. You're an all star at that. Thank you, and and it's because I sincerely have appreciation for them. And uh, throughout life, they've kind of woven themselves back into my life and some of the biggest blessings. Like my friend that worked for the airline. Like uh, like my, my German friend with Amazon Prime Video. There are people that I, I was friend with for five years that ne never really did anything quote unquote for me. Um, and yet, uh, because of the friendship and the love that we have, it's just there was a right time and there was a right place and they're part of the success. There it is, man. The global child himself. How can people follow the journey? How can people tell them about your book? Because it's amazing. Sure. So you can find us. Uh, our Instagram is Global Child TV. The name of the show is Global Child Travel with Purpose. If you have a smart TV, you just type Global Child. Again, I recommend uh, Peacock. You can see it on their Roku channel, Tubi, Vizio, Apple Plus. And we have a book called Global Child. You can find it on Amazon Prime Video. It has all the lessons that we learned while filming season one. And uh, it's in English. It's also in Spanish. And we also have a really cool uh, website, globalchildtv.com. We have a full merchandise line, which uh, shout out to Paul Taunton. He's Peter Taunton's twin I brother. I love Paul, man. Paul is amazing. He's such a they, good guy. They made the coolest jackets for us. So when you see the episodes, you're going to see all these cool like uniforms with the badge and the hats and the backpacks and all that stuff's for sale. And it's super cool. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, honored. If you're hearing this right now as well and you have causes that you want to help, if I can be of service to anyone who's hearing right now, uh, let us know. I'm always happy to connect and see how we can make the world a better place together. This is the damn good day show with the damn good guest. Such a good human. A goose still on Veritas. I appreciate you, man. We've got to make this a normal thing now. Every time you come back from all these trips, we got to get the get the fill in, man. No, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I think you're doing a magnificent job and uh, always happy to, to come by and visit. Till next time. Till next time. This is a damn good day to have a damn good day.